Awesome. So uh, welcome everyone um, to this week's uh, Australian Computing Academy uh, Monday webinar. Um, this webinar is Interactions and it's actually um, the last in this series of webinars um, that we've been running on the Mondays, um, but we'll hopefully run some more um, in later terms. Um, and uh, Kenny will uh, talk a bit about the office hours that he's planning to run um, next week as well, if you'd like to um, come to those. So yep. um, I'm Daniel Hickmott and I'm an um, Associate Lecturer at the Australian Computing Academy um, and the University of Sydney. Uh, so at the moment, I'm working on the Masters of Education uh, Digital Technology Specialisation. Um, and so if you haven't heard of that, it's basically a, um, a Masters of Education degree for teachers that are looking to upskill in digital technologies um, in terms of both content and pedagogy. Um, and, you know, also for teachers that are looking to, um, you know, take a, a leadership role in um, the implementation of digital technologies. Um, and there's also opportunities uh, for research and that sort of thing. Um, so I just thought I'd give that a bit of a, a plug at the start, but um, th that's my role. Um, and I'm joined today uh, by Kenny, and I'll, he's also a computing education specialist here at the Australian Computing Academy um, at the University of Sydney. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Bruce, uh, Kenny. Yeah, I guess what I do is uh, work on resources and uh, webinars like this and if you want to see more webinars like this and the resources in general you can go to uh, aca.edu.au forward slash resources and you can see our list of previous webinars uh, and this is the last in the series so um, once I've uploaded this one you'll be able to go through every single one of them um, but uh, next week we'll be uh, trialing running uh, office hours so you can come in and uh, come into this webinar so the same way that you signed up for this webinar, you can go to Eventbrite and sign up for the one next week. You can ask us questions about anything in particular. So, you know, if you're interested in the uh, Masters of Education, you can talk to Dan. I mean, you can send him an email anytime. But if you if you want to have a conversation, uh, feel free to drop in then. Uh, or you can talk to me about, um, uh, uh, you know, your programming problems or uh, an assessment you want to run and you want advice on it. Uh, just anything that you, you have some sort of interest in, come in next week, we're trialing it out. Um, so if you think that's the sort of thing you might want in the future and you're not sure that you have a question, uh, just come in and join and uh, that'll encourage us to keep doing it. Uh, all right, you wanna uh, go to the, get started on the webinar, Dan? Um, a link for the um, event. Um, yeah, that, that'll be on our, um, and our webinars page on our, uh, our on our website, uh, but uh, I can send you a link now um, directly to the event, right? Um, th then that, that's um, I just put a link there, but can you send you a, a link to the um, event right page? But that's a good place to check too, as well to keep up with um, the different events that we're holding, as well as the um, the ACA uh, mailing list. So um, we're going to be using our annotations in Zoom um, a bit through this webinar um, for some interactive activities. Um, if you haven't used it before, sorry, I'm just... One second. Um, okay, so um, if you haven't used them before, uh, they'll be at the top of the screen uh, where you can see my slides. There'll be a view options. If you click down on that and then go to annotate, um, you should see um, some options like stamp and text. So what I'd like you to do is just make sure that works and just stamp somewhere on the slides. Um, just choose any um, slides, uh, any sort of stamp or text. Yep, so there's a couple of people there. Um, that's good, a few people have had it. All right, awesome. So. Um, oh, someone's saying hello. Awesome. Um, so what we'll do is, um, oh, sorry, that just went haywire. Um, what we'll do, uh, what I'd like you to do now, so uh, with the um, annotations, 
we've got a whole bunch of different examples of here of ways that um, students uh, collaborate. Um, and so um, uh, there's a bunch of yeah, uh, different examples here. What I'd like you to do is stamp um, in the cells where you're using these methods of collaboration with your students. Yeah, so I, um, someone mentioned in the uh, chat that they've been doing um, remote learning uh, recently. Uh, so probably a bit of um, Zoom or Microsoft Teams for um, accommodating that. Awesome. Does anyone have any other examples of ways that they get their students to collaborate? So this could be in digital technologies or this could just be in um, general classes. Yeah. So a lot of people using Google Docs, um, some people in Teams, uh, a couple of people in Zoom. So um, what we're going to talk about in this uh, webinar is interactions. And one of the um, type of interactions that we talk about is, is students using digital technologies to um, collaborate with each other. So I'll speak to that um, very shortly. Yeah, we'll just clear that one. Oh. So I'll move to the next slide. So today's uh, webinar is all about interactions and interactions is one of the 10 key concepts in the digital technologies curriculum. Um, and I'll, in a minute, I'll, I'll show you a really good resource for um, understanding uh, what each of those 10 key concepts are. So when we talk about interactions, there's human to human interactions and human computer interactions. Um, and we'll explain those shortly. And what we're gonna do in this webinar is explain some recommended resources um, which you can use um, when teaching uh, interactions, and we'll also demonstrate some interactive activities as well. So um, looking at the digital technology sequence of content, so this is available from uh, the ACARA website. Um, this shows all the um, uh, content descriptions for the um, digital technologies uh, curriculum. And what we've done here is we've highlighted the um, relevant content descriptions for uh, interactions. So um, we talk about generating and designing, so talking about user interfaces and user experience. Um, we also talk about collaborating and managing. So, um, you know, getting students to work together um, on projects and plan their own projects as well. So um, that's a really useful resource for um, getting an understanding of the um, uh, curriculum. And the way that you can find that is through the ACARA website um, and then going to the Understand How Technologies Works uh, PDF documents. And you'll be able to see all that uh, content as oh, And Kenny's just linked that in the um, chat as well if you'd like to see that. So now on to interactions. So when we talk about interactions, we're talking about um, human inter interactions with information systems or digital systems. Um, so talking about user interfaces and experiences. We're also talking about human to human interactions, which involve um, collaborating with um, information systems or digital systems. And another thing that we also look at um, and which we'll speak to shortly is the idea of cyber safety. Um, and managing, um, managing your, your data safely um, online is really in, into that. So the Australian Computing Academy uh, breaks down those interactions into two, um, two uh, key concepts. Um, human to human interactions, where we're talking about getting students to work together um, using digital systems. So there was a few people that marked that they were using Google Docs. So that's a good example of um, human to human interactions with digital technologies, um, students working together on Google Docs. Um, and we also uh, look at human computer interactions. So that's when we're talking about um, students experiencing and interfacing with digital systems. Um, so a good example of this and where there's a sort of a key difference is that um, with human to human interactions, students are using those digital systems to collaborate. Whereas with human computer interactions, the students are really creating their own um, digital systems and, and solutions. 
So we'll refer to this a few times, but um, this is a really useful resource um, if you haven't seen it already. It's the um, ACA's Unpacking the Curriculum uh, resource. So uh, the curriculum writers have, um, have contributed to this and are uh, continually updating it with information, um, really explaining what um, all the content descriptions in the, in the curriculum mean and giving really concrete examples of, of how to implement those in the classroom. And this is an example uh, from the website, from the Unpacking website, um, which show human-to-human uh, -human interactions and human-computer interactions. Um, and what is what are the main expectations at uh, the different band levels? Um, so we'll speak to that soon as well. So I'm going to talk briefly about human human interactions, um, and within that, there's these three sort of main uh, overarching topics: um, the idea of creating information, uh, communicating and collaborating, and planning and managing. So when we talk about creating information, um, we're talking about using digital technologies to um, create something. So often that involves the manipulation of data and presenting some sort of product. Um, so that could be, um, you know, a scratch coding project um, is an example of that. Um, and there's a lot of overlap with um, the general ICT capabilities, particularly at um, F to six levels. Um, but as we get into seven to eight and nine and 10, it's, um, there's more of a focus on uh, digital uh, technology specifically. And so project management. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, a few different examples of that. Um, you know, things like, uh, particularly in you know, F to six, having um, students take photos on phones and tablets and sharing them, um, you know, using Microsoft Word to create reports and so on. Um, and there's really those opportunities um, at F to six, you know, where you're teaching across different subjects. Um, there's good opportunities there for um, integrating digital technologies um, within different subject areas. Um, and there's other examples there of creating information, things like spreadsheets, um, uh, coding projects with micro bits and so on. Uh, another aspect within human to human interactions is the idea of um, collaboration. Um, so this is when students are using online tools to um, work together on projects. Um, so for example, um, there's a, you know, particularly when you're looking at sort of the, the seven to eight and, and upwards, the idea of getting students to work together on um, using software like Google Docs or Microsoft Teams. Um, there's this uh, cool website called Replit um, where basically you can get students to work on the same programming projects together at the same time, um, which is an example of doing that um, specifically teaching uh, implementation. Sorry, I'm just uh, reading that, reading the comment from Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne's got some good examples of how he's getting kids to collaborate in his class, um, especially when you um, go back yeah, into the class. Um, um, yeah, that's that's a really good example, um, and. Um, I just had a, a question about um, using tools that aren't online, so um, which is a good question. I mean, there's there's um, ways that you can collaborate with digital technologies um, with it. They don't have to necessarily be online. So, um, you know, getting students to use an iPad and work together on a on a project, say. Um, uh, maybe if like a, I don't know, like a short film or a programming, maybe a, a, a coding uh, puzzle or something like that, that doesn't necessarily need to be online, um, particularly sort of in that F, F to six levels. Um, but yeah, the examples that we have here are all online, but um, there is of course opportunities for using digital technologies um, offline um, and having students collaborate together. Um, and I might, I might have to think about some specific examples of that, but um, that's a good question. Um, so with a good example is we have a 
a course for micro bits on radios. So if you've got micro bits in your classroom, um, you can get the micro bits to communicate with each other. And, uh, you know, it's uh, a great way where you don't have to be online necessarily. Uh, you can just program the micro bits locally and get them to send messages to each other. Uh, and it's a nice collaborative way to work. Um, but other than that, anytime you're doing a group project and it involves technology of some kind, like typing up a project, creating a presentation, that's an example of, in, especially in those younger years, of doing collaboration with digital technologies. That's great. Jenna just said they've done some uh, micro bit radio stuff. So that's great to hear. It sounds really good. Um, and another aspect of um, human to human interactions is the idea of cyber safety. Um, so what we've done here is we've just um, put some notes about um, clarifying cyber safety versus cyber security because you might have um, heard both of those terms before. So cyber safety is really on, you know, protecting your information um, and sort of, um, you know, using... Um, Keeping yourself safe online. Yeah. And I guess a, a good example is, you know, if you're using social media and so on, so on knowing um, what information is appropriate to share um, is a good example of that. Whereas when we're talking about cyber security, um, we're talking about um, keeping sort of other people's information safe. And, um, you know, when you think about uh, like software engineers and, and programmers, you know, the methods and, and the tools that they use to keep um, information safe. Um, so you might have heard of cryptography before. Um, which involves, um, you know, uh, uh, securing uh, information. So that, that's just the, the uh, um, a bit of a um, explanation of, of what those different uh, terms mean. And today we're talking mainly about cyber safety, but the ACA has um, resources for both cyber safety and uh, cyber security. So we've got a link there um, to uh, the cyber challenges. Um, which are a really cool um, free resource um, for schools to use to teach um, cyber safety and cyber security. Um, and there's also the eSafety um, Commissioner's website as well, which is worth checking out. So obviously, uh, you know, cyber safety um, is incredibly important um, uh, at the moment um, and having students understand um, information that can be shared and should be shared and, and some of the risks involved is, is very important at the moment, um, I guess now more than ever. Um, with that in mind, um, we're just going to do a quick um, interactive activity uh, here. And so, um, yep, cool, so someone's, someone's ticked. So I know some people can't use it, but maybe what you can do um, is you can put your response in the chat. Um, to this activity. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use a, um, a resource that's actually also been developed by the Australian Computing Academy. And we have a link to this in the, um, in the slides. Um, Just having a bit Kenny. of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to present a card. So we have a card here on the left and it's saying uh, your nickname. And basically we're asking, is it safe for students to share this information? So put a vote for what you think um, in the relevant cell. So I'll just um, oh, yeah, give you um, a minute to do that. And, um, and Kenny has hopefully put my name in the name badge. <laughs> So is it safe to share that my nickname is Dan? Okay, that's interesting. So um, most are in the uh, in the share with caution, which is very interesting. Um, with a couple in the okay to share, none in the don't share. So we have this uh, as uh, okay to share, and I think the key point there is that you know a nickname, um, if it's not linked to your actual identity. Um, then it's okay to share. Um, so you, this might be a nickname like Dan, or it might be um, something like a, um, if you're familiar with like gaming and people have their gamer tags and, and so on that might not identify them, 
um, then that's okay. It's, it's okay to share them. So um, that one was okay to share. Let's have a go at this one. And I'm just going to clear that one. So, oh, sorry. I accidentally cleared some. So uh, just try again. I do like how it says new driver's license. Um, as if there's a difference between sharing a new and old one. I think the intent was here that, and I've seen this before, people being excited about getting new driver's license or new credit cards or something like that and posting pictures of them. Um, sort of like when people, um, there's been people that have uh, bought a ticket to um, a gig and then they go, oh yes, I got a ticket to um, some gig and then they put it on Facebook and then someone can go and take that number and steal it. Um, so a lot of people have put um, don't share, um, which uh, seems pretty sensible to me. And so, yes, so obviously um, uh, that's not a very um, good thing to share um, and to the and you know this might seem uh, a bit obvious, but um, as Kenny said, there's people that might do this because they think, oh, you know, um, I I want to show that I've just got my driver's license, and um, yeah. So obvious. Uh, so yeah. So showing people the photo in person, um, if you really need to do it, or um, yeah, don't don't uh, share that sort of information. It, it should be noted that here when we're just saying sharing, that we're saying with um, public or semi-public accounts because obviously sometimes you do have to share things for identity you are showing people your id when you're um when you're driving and that sort of thing uh, so we are talking in the context of you know online and social media yeah yeah so now we have a uh, school name okay we've got a few people who share with caution yeah, got one in the chat for with caution. Um, oh, someone's put okay to share. So yeah, with this one, um, everyone was um, on the money with this one. Well, the majority. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So sharing with caution. So uh, yeah. So. The key thing here is, um, as Kenny mentioned, you know, the idea of this is if you're posting things on um, social media, particularly with things like, um, you know, I guess, Twitter, and I think in some cases, Instagram can be um, public. So um, having your school name, like having, you know, if a student has their school name up and available uh, to the public, um, that can be um, quite risky because uh, people can, can find your location. So uh, the key here, yeah, sharing with caution um, and thinking about who can see um, that information is really key there. It's important to consider what are the implications of revealing information. Uh, and it may not seem like much revealing where your school is, but it does reveal a lot about your location and that sort of thing. And so, you know, the caution is, do you want to share information about your location because you're not merely sharing information about your school, but you're sharing extra things that you may not have thought about. Um, uh, and so there are a whole bunch of these cards, um, which Dan is going to talk about. Yeah, so um, there's a link here in the, um, in the uh, slides. Um, I, can also, I might just copy them in as well. Um, so there's not just three, I can't remember exactly how many there is, but there's a whole bunch of different examples and, um, you know, where it can be interesting, um, well, particularly interesting is um, those ones where it's, you know, share with caution or there's a bit of, um, it's not sort of a definite yes or no, and there can be a bit of discussion about um, particular context when it's okay to share um, that information and when it's not. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a really good resource um, to check out, as well as the not just the cyber sharing cards, but also the um, challenges themselves as well. So, another part of uh, human to human interactions is the idea of planning and managing projects. 
Um, and so the important thing here is that students are, you know, documenting how they've um, approached to solving a particular problem. Um, so the overall thing is, you know, well, the overall um, objective is having students to develop plans, um, both on their own and with their uh, fellow students. Uh, in primary years, it's um, sort of more about recognizing that there's steps to take in a solution. Um, when you get to seven and eight, it's more about you know, the students have a bit more autonomy and their sort of the expectations is that they um, develop a project plan um, from start to finish. Um, and then in year nine and 10, um, there's also sort of consideration for um, risks that happen in projects, um, the limitations that they have around um, resourcing and time, um, and also some of the, the uh, potential legal responsibilities for digital technologies projects. And so, um, a key thing here is that in after six, um, there's a lot of overlap with um, the ICT uh, capabilities. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities for um, integration across different subjects. Um, when we get to seven and eight, it's um, a bit more specific to uh, digital technologies and, um, and projects in that subject area. So for example, um, in the three, four students, it might be that you're getting them to create a small presentation about something that they've learned about uh, ancient Egypt, Egyptian history or something like that. And you can get them to uh, talk about what their plan would be to first get the information for the presentation and then create the presentation. Um, you know, so it might be, I'm going to Google some things and click on some websites, and then I'm going to use PowerPoint to create my presentation or something like that. Um, so what we have here is a table. Um, and so at the top row, we have these sort of different um, aspects of human to human interactions. So sort of the main topics um, that should be covered. Um, and then in each, in each column, uh, we go through the, the different band levels. So we have F to two, three to four, um, five to six, seven to eight, and nine to 10. Um, and as we go um, down the columns, the um, the expectations are different for um, those different band levels. So when I'm uh, talking through uh, the different uh, examples, um, maybe put a tick or a cross um, with a stamp of which of these you're currently teaching. Um, so for example, um, you know, if you've got students that are presenting and sharing information already, um, then you could put a tick um, stamp in here um, and so on. So when we're looking at when we're looking at uh, creating information um, in the F2, it's about presenting and sharing information. So um, this could be students putting together, um, you know, Google Slides or a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. Or, or in those um, years, it might just be taking a photo or something like that. Yep, um, taking a photo and, sh and sharing it in some sort of class. Um, Yep, we're just taking a photo, photo and sharing it, yep. Um, so using software to answer questions, so um, this could be, you know, searching uh, for answers on a search engine, uh, for example. Um, explaining uh, the answers they developed, so maybe putting a, together a report um, about a particular topic um, in Microsoft Word. Um, when we get to seven to eight, um, exploring connections and creating plans, so um, this is where they, you know, they're um, planning uh, projects and, you know, using um, a, a good example is a mind map, um, you know, using some sort of digital tool that you can use. Um, to think about your project. Yeah. You yeah. So, it's, you know, using a tool like that to assist in, in the planning of a project. Um, and then in nine and 10, um, you know, creating adaptable and interactive solutions. So, um, really one of the key ideas um, when we're talking about planning and managing is the idea that students um, are developing projects iteratively. Um, so getting feedback on them and, um, you know, uh, planning, getting feedback, sorry, planning, prototyping, getting some feedback, taking that feedback on board and um, making changes to their project plan appropriately. Um, so that's what is really mean, meant by um, you know, I guess, at adapting. 
Um, so when we talk about communicating and collaborating, so in after two, you're talking about um, having students collaborating on small tasks. So um, in, in the context of using digital technologies, that could be, um, you know, the example of getting students to work on, um, uh, if you've seen B bots and those sort of things like the, um, those small robots maybe working together to solve a problem with those. Um, and uh, when we talk about the next one, collaborating on larger tasks and so on, um, you know, maybe having a, a, a Google Classroom or um, similar where students are um, working together on projects and, and um, communicating through those. Um, uh, five to six, talking about, um, you know, the cyber safety aspects that we mentioned before, um, the idea of how do we keep our information uh, safe and thinking about what is um, actually appropriate online behaviour. Uh, when we get to seven to eight, um, the idea of, uh, again, cyber safety, um, using different social media platforms, you know, what are the appropriate uses of different uh, social media platforms, uh, like Twitter and Instagram and so on. Um, and then in nine to 10, and the idea of collaborating publicly um, to secure digital solutions and legal responsibilities. Um, so for those that are maybe doing, um, that have done a bit of uh, coding and particularly at the nine to 10 levels, um, there's websites like um, Stack Overflow and GitHub. Um, you know, something like GitHub, it, it allows you to collaborate with people all across the world and make your coding projects available um, basically to everyone. Um, so that's a good example of, of um, a site that could be used um, for collaborating publicly. Uh, yeah, so we've got a, a few people um, uh, teaching those different uh, topics across the different band levels. Um, and so the final aspect is that plan and manage. So uh, that's not really explicitly addressed for digital technologies in uh, FT2, uh, but when we get to uh, three to four, the idea of um, having problems as, as, you know, as a sequence of steps, um, and then uh, having uh, five to six more complex problems. So um, this, I guess an example for three to four um, is having students think about what are the steps when we go shopping, um, you know, we compile a shopping list, um, we go to the shops and so on. Um, five to six, um, you might get students to plan out projects um, and then some really good uh, work samples available from ACARA where, and I'm thinking specifically of scratch coding projects, uh, where they have a, um, some really good uh, work samples of templates that students can fill out when planning projects. So things like that um, are, are a good example of uh, those sort of plans. Seven to eight, um, developing plans again, um, but also having collaboration with students um, and being able to plan out those group tasks. And then getting that to that nine and 10 level, um, the key thing there being the idea of iteration and you know, having milestones where students um, plan out a project uh, and then get feedback and make uh, changes based on that feedback and the idea of risk management as well. So thinking about what are the things that could go wrong with their project and how they're gonna mm. resolve those problems as uh, quickly and easily as possible. Yeah, so I'll hand over to uh, Kenny. Yep, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, human-computer interactions. Um, and what I just realized is that I was sharing, uh, oops, sharing the presentation before we edited it. So I'm going to have to exit out oh, okay. and go back in. No worries. Uh, was there any questions about human to human um, interactions while uh, Kenny's switching across? All right. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yep, you can see it. Great. Um, all right. So I'm talking about human computer interactions. And so, as opposed to human to human interactions, this is a really thinking about um, not how we use the tools, but how we create the tools and um, 
kind of critiquing uh, what they're like. So we're evaluating the designs of them and thinking about their user experience. Um, so first, let's talk about what uh, digital technologies are made up of. And they're made up of user interfaces, which are the ways that we interact with them. So there's inputs and then there's outputs. So inputs are things like buttons, and that can be you know, like the physical buttons on your keyboard, or it can be virtual buttons, like a button that's on a touch screen, or um, like a button that you click with your mouse. Um, and there are text prompts, so we can enter in different text. Um, but there are things that are completely unrelated to like laptop or desktop, or even smartphones, which I guess smartphones also have it now, but voice interfaces. So when you talk to the Alexa um, sitting on your wall, um, that's another way of inputting information into a digital uh, solution. Uh, and then we have outputs, so things like the text um, on a website is an output, um, or LEDs, so if you're using micro bits in your classroom, those have buttons, but they also have LEDs where you can output information back to the user. Uh, charts are a way of outputting um, different kinds of information, like visual information. You can also have audio information, so you know, you can have little things and notifications, um, or if you've got um, the example of the Google Home or Alexa again, it gives you back uh, music or uh, answers your question with voices. So there's all kinds of user interfaces, um, but it's not enough just to talk about user interfaces. We also need to talk about user experience, uh, which goes beyond just the user interface. Um, so UX encompasses how a digital technology is used to solve problems. So we're not just talking about, you know, Microsoft's Word and the fact that it has a bunch of buttons and things to, to click, but we're also talking about, okay, what I'm using Microsoft Word to create a report for my uh, English class. Uh, and so how well is this technology suited to solving my problem? Um, how it looks and appears to users. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we're not just talking about uh, the things that, that make it good to use, but also does it look good? Uh, and what does it uh, what does it appear like when I look at it? And so uh, you'll notice that over the years, um, that word has appeared differently. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of people, uh, except for those who, who grew up using the old version, uh, seem to believe that it, that it looks better and better over time uh, as incremental improvements happen. And how does it make you, the user feel? Uh, and you know, this is often phrased as the joy of use. And um, one thing to remember is that uh, because the tools are used to solve problems, often people just want, want the tool to get out of their way and let them do what they want to do. And so uh, you can think about uh, how it makes a user feel when they look at a, a blank page and have to get started on a, on a project. Maybe that makes them feel a bit, um, a bit uh, uh, anxious about the thing, uh, and you can see that there have been different solutions over the years to this, um, with like uh, suggested text, or uh, you know, there have been missteps in UX where we've got things like Clippy suggesting, hey, it looks like you want to write a letter, but um, making users feel a bit annoyed rather than making them feel less daunted about the task ahead. Uh, so, you know, like I said, bad user UX can frustrate users. It can result in incorrect data being entered, lost business and other problems. Uh, it, can, uh, it can result in people being annoyed at your product uh, or, you know, uh, the tool that you've created for them. Um, and UX isn't just about the appearance or the buttons or whatever it is. It's about everything related to it. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about an app like Uber or uh, like menu log when you're ordering food. It's not just about um, the digital experience, but also uh, how has the app been arranged to facilitate those real world um, interactions as well. Uh, some of the other things you need to consider are accessibility. So if you're making something for a large public audience, uh, they might have different problems that you, uh, you wouldn't have considered normally. So if they're colorblind, uh, you can't use red and green to distinguish things uh, because you don't know, um, like you, you're making things a little bit harder for them if you're using color to, the colors red and green to distinguish things. Um, there are other types of accessibility like uh, low mobility. So if you make small buttons or small text, uh, it can sometimes be hard to, to do things uh, and low visual uh, acuity and that sort of thing. 
Uh, the other things to consider are information architecture. So like uh, sometimes you'll go to websites uh, and I'm sure this is especially true when you're dealing with uh, government things and uh, things in education where you go to a website and you don't know where anything's located because it's located in a non-intuitive way. And so that's what your user experience is about. So, you know, next time you go to a, a website and you think nothing's where I would want it to be, you know, it doesn't seem to be in the right place. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about user experience. Um, so there's usability.gov, um, which has a bit of an explanation about user experience if you want to learn more. Um, so I suggest going to that if you'd like to learn a bit more in depth. Um, so you, the concept of usability, um, I'm going to give you a quote here from uh, a book by Steve Crow, which is, people often ask me, what's the most important thing I should do if I want to make sure my site or app is easy to use? The answer is simple. It's not nothing important should ever be more than two clicks away or speak the user's language or be consistent. It's don't make me think. And don't make me think is a bit of a, um, it's a bit of summary of all of those ideas, which is that uh, if you make things difficult for people and you make them have to think about the tool that you've given them rather than the task that they're doing, uh, it can be a bit frustrating. Um, like you can imagine how annoying it would be if you had a hammer and you wanted to hammer in some nails, um, but you had to log in every time um, because it, the, the hammer made you log in for some weird reason. Uh, so it's really what we're talking about when we're talking about usability is not making people think about the tool they're using, but thinking, allowing them to think about nailing in those nails uh, with that tool. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to talk about a particular tool that I'm sure all of you have used, especially uh, in the, the most recent few months, which is the TV remote. And so here we can see a bunch of different TV remote examples uh, in Silhouette. You can see that some of them might make you think quite a lot about uh, what you need to do. Uh, in order to do a particular task with the TV, like turn the volume up and down. Uh, and we've got a, a, a DT at home challenge, uh, which we created for um, while well, lots of students are working at home. Uh, so there's a PDF there, uh, and I think it's designed for year seven and eight students in particular, but you can adapt it for, uh, for older or younger students. Uh, so you can go to aca.edu.au slash resources slash TV torment if, if you think this activity might be good for the students in your class. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do uh, some evaluating designs. So here I've got four different uh, TV remotes and uh, I'm going to get everyone to get out their stamp tools again. And I'm going to get you to do some ticks and crosses on, uh, on the ones that you think are, are good for like a tick for good or a cross for bad. So keeping in mind the idea of usability, uh, look and feel, uh, and that sort of thing. So everybody's liking the designs so far. Now, if anyone's feeling particularly brave, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, tell me what you think about uh, any of these designs, particularly if you did something that was slightly different to everyone else. No one's feeling brave. I'm interested in the person that's put a little cross on the uh, Apple TV remote here. No, a bit shy. All right. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we're generally kind of uh, on the same page with a lot of these. Like every, almost everyone thinks the Apple TV remote is good. Uh, and everyone thinks the one on the left is bad. Too many buttons, uh, too weird looking. Uh, the one in the middle, that's kind of the standard TV remote that a lot of people have. I've got one of those in my house. Uh, and, uh, you know, the reasons that why these are good or bad are various, right? So the one, uh, the second one there, uh, the standard TV remote, I think that one's pretty good because Whenever I pick up someone else's remote, I know immediately where to change the volume and where to change the, the channel. Um, but there are buttons on there that I don't really know much about, and they probably do something different on everyone else's TV. 
Uh, so there are some things about it which aren't as good as they could be. So I can see why some people X is. With the Apple TV remote, um, most people put ticks because it's nice and simple. If you want to change the volume or change the channel or play a pause, fairly simple. But if you want to do something more complicated, uh, it can be a bit more difficult. Uh, it's got that little voice interface there, which you know for some people might be a better interface than other ones. Um, but you know sometimes those things go wrong, as we all know if we've used voice interfaces before, uh, and that can be frustrating. And I find voice interfaces quite frustrating, so I can see why someone's put a cross there. Um, the other thing is if you've got a smart TV, which is something that's only come about in the last ten or so years, that often you want to be entering in. Uh, text information rather than just changing the channel up and down. So you want to get to a specific program uh, to watch on Netflix or whatever it is. Um, and you can see how the Apple remote would be annoying for that because you have to press up and down multiple times to get to anything. And so if you're looking for something specific, that could be a more annoying design than the other ones. So like the design on the left where it's got a keyboard, that could actually be quite a usable design in that scenario. Um, so I think it's uh, worth considering uh, not only whether something's complicated or not, but whether it uh, suits a particular scenario. Uh, and this is something we're going to talk about a little bit about how uh, you might have different designs for different scenarios, uh, which is exactly what the remote on the right has done. It's taken a complicated remote and stuck some paper over it and said, okay, here are just the things that you need. And I think this is a good example of a design that was complicated, uh, but has been adapted to someone's specific needs. The nice thing about it is that if you ever do need to use any of those other complicated buttons that are presumably hiding behind that red paper, you can just take the paper off, uh, which I think is a, a clever and creative design. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to clear the screen here and we're going to do another activity, which is I want everyone to think about uh, how they would design a TV remote for kids under five years old. So if you've got a piece of paper near or you've got uh, a phone or something available, uh, that'd be great to get out um, and start drawing on it. Uh, and I'm going to give you uh, three minutes and then I'm uh, going to see what the ideas that we've got are. So things to think about while you're designing this remote is like, uh, you know, what do you want your kid to be able to do? Like, uh, do you want them to be able to watch Peppa Pig? Do you want them to be able to change channels or not? Should they be able to turn the TV on and off? Uh, are they allowed to control the volume? Uh, what sort of capabilities do the children have? Uh, like, can they read buttons if you write channel up and channel down? Maybe, maybe not. Um, how young are these kids under five? Um, like, if they're real young, they might have a little bit of difficulty being dexterous, so small buttons might be a bit, a bit too much. Uh, so if you're uh, currently designing your remote and you think you've got a pretty good design, um, uh, unmute yourself and start talking and we'll listen to you. Uh, you're welcome to annotate on the screen and draw your design as well. So I'm not particularly creative. Yep. Uh, I'm not particularly creative in terms of designing, but uh, kids, um, kids are, are digital natives, and they're also not frightened of anything. And uh, as an older person, I tend to start worrying about, oh goodness, what's going to happen if I press this button and something goes wrong? And uh, children just don't seem to have those fears, uh, you know, from growing up with it. So I'd almost suggest that something along the lines of the Apple would be almost intuitive for them uh, because you know, there's, there's numerous stories of kids walking up to paintings and trying to swipe on the painting to see what the next picture is. That's just what they're used to. So I, I think maybe you were looking for someone to, you know, one have one with lots of you know, bright, you know, bright buttons and simple buttons on it, but the kid, kids don't necessarily need that. They're looking for swipe pads, I think, and, and, uh, and, and so on because they, they're just, it's what they live with all the time. Yeah, and drawing your remote here, is this it? It's a big, big black square. Yeah, it, it could be almost looks like a big touchpad almost. Yes, with a, with a voice recognition of some description on there. We might have a little remote uh, microphone on it. Yeah, that's a good... Yeah. No, I wasn't looking for any prescriptive ideas. I think it's good to think about 
uh, what you think uh, a kid would like. Uh, anyone else got any other ideas? Perhaps some coloured icons instead of um, any kind of words, but if you had, say, the th three or four, maybe even five icons that could be programmed by the adult. Um, yeah. So you would have... Uh, like you'd have your Peppa Pig and whatever else is on there yeah. um, as an icon that you could load. Yeah, so that might be a, either like a touchpad or maybe uh, it could be like... Uh, like, some built like pieces, pieces of paper underneath, but like you're thinking um, more buttons that do more, buttons, and more like a, a dedicated, um, basically an app that is um, on the on the desktop of yeah. a, a touchscreen. Yeah, so, that's quite a good suggestion. Um, I was quite astounded at how much a three-year-old could actually navigate around and find their particular version of entertainment um, in, a, in a maze of things without doing anything, just deliberately looking for the specific thing they wanted. Um, they're really quite good at that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, when you're, you know, necessi necessity is the mother of all invention and for kids it's necessary to have entertainment. So, you know, they'll learn the shortcuts to get to, to what they want quite often. Uh, anyone else got any suggestions? So there was an example or uh, a feature in um, the chat, which is quite similar to um, uh, the idea uh, from Jenny there, the, you know, having something colorful and different shape buttons, um, maybe having somebody almost like a, a tablet, I guess, with um, big, large buttons for the, for the kid to, to press. They were imagining different shapes. I think that would be good. Yeah. Because, um, they may not be able to recognize um, text or so having different shapes might be um, the way to do it. Yeah. Um, should I should I draw the one that I drew this afternoon when we when we were or well, actually this morning when we were trying this, Kenny? Uh, yeah. How about you draw draw your and tell us your philosophy on on what kids should be able to do with televisions. So when I did this this afternoon, I basically said. Um, I'm going to try and write CH there. Um, basically, giving them the option of switching channels, and that's pretty much it. So, um, Kenny raised a good point when we we're talking about this earlier that you don't necessarily want um, a kid to control the volume because they may um, be pretty silly with it, and um, uh, I guess raise the volume, but. Uh, you know, that's maybe in a way that's a bit too limiting and they should have all the different options um, so that they can learn um, what options to, to not use. So that was that was my first thought when I um, was thinking about this. Basically, they have the options to flick through channels and another good point from Kenny was that um, would you also want to limit the channels that they can see? Um, so, for example, um, you know, would you want to limit that they can only see uh, channels that have cartoons on them at a certain time or so on? So, um, yeah, so that was, my, that was my thoughts. So it's interesting, we've got a real uh, range of designs there. I'm going to clear our designs. Uh, but this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, generating lists of designs. Um, but once you've generated a design, what do you do next? Well, the next thing to do is to talk about prototyping and iteration. So here we've got examples of different kinds of prototyping um, from lo-fi to hi-fi. And generally what we want is to do those lo-fi designs. So those drawings that we did with a, a version of lo-fi designs. Um, and then hi-fi designs are designs that are closer to, the, to what the final product might look like. Um, and now that's a little bit harder for a TV remote, but maybe you're looking at uh, using micro bits or Arduinos to, to create those buttons um, and you know, uh, getting closer to something that looks physically like a remote. And mid fi fire is something in between where you can interact with it and do something uh, fancy. Um, and so for our, um, our remotes, we might be thinking about doing drawings of them. Uh, and we might think about uh, once we've got uh, a more concrete kind of design that people can interact with, 
uh, thinking about how we can then test that for more um, and how then once we've done the testing, how we can move on to more high fidelity designs. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, with our user testing uh, with our remote, we could take those drawings that we did of the remotes, um, like physically do them on paper, uh, hand them to someone and say, uh, especially a kid under five, um, hand them to a kid and say, okay, press, uh, you want to use the TV, this is a, a remote, press the button that you want to do. Now, obviously, it's just a piece of paper and they don't, and they probably know that. Um, but if you want to do uh, user testing, you can give them that paper and you can pretend that it's a real remote and you, you're you sitting behind them with the real remote uh, doing the actions that they pretend doing with the, uh, with the pretend remote. Um, so you can be creative with your user testing. You can uh, create high fidel more high fidelity prototypes out of lower ones just by being a little bit creative with those things. Um, but yeah, the thing to think about is that students shouldn't be having a complete design before they test with users because you'll learn things that you didn't really realize about the problem and how people solve the problem. And so more testing earlier on is better, especially in those later years where they're going to be designing uh, big projects in their classes. So if you can get them to test with the people that are using them, uh, the better. And so if you can encourage them to do projects that are for peers or teachers or family members, that's great. Uh, but if they're really ambitious, they might get community members if they feel like they're uh, confident enough to go out and to, to speak to people in public. Um, so, you know, I'd encourage students to do problems that are, um, uh, are problems for the people that they're interacting with. Um, so to summarize, summarize all that, and I'm going to get you to do those stamps again. Um, Here's what it looks like in terms of band levels um, over the years. So we've got generating designs and evaluating designs. Um, so put a tick or a, a cross if you're doing those things in your classroom. So are you getting your students to design in, in user interfaces? Uh, it's not necessary to implement them. So just like we had with our uh, remotes, uh, you're getting them to draw little designs for them um, uh, and having a go and that sort of thing. Are you getting them to generate a range of designs? So Collaboratively, we generated a range of des designs. Um, do you get them to test those designs with users? So are they drawing pictures or are they using, um, once they've drawn some pictures and tested it with users, are they using apps um, to allow them to prototype their design? And then are they testing those designs um, by programming uh, websites or apps or whatever it is uh, to do those final things? Uh, so you can see the progression there over years, going from designing things to actually creating those uh, more complex experiences. Uh, and in terms of evaluating designs, you're getting them to justify their designs. So we did that as well. We got you to talk about what your design was and why you thought it was a good idea. Uh, in year nine, 10, we're getting them to, get, sorry, year seven, eight, we're getting them to compare and contrast user experience of alternative designs. So that's what we did first up when we were evaluating the the different uh, complicated TV remotes that we talked about. Uh, and the final one is using objective criteria gathered from users to evaluate design. So we didn't really talk about this, but it's like uh, you're getting them to sit down with the users of their design and uh, taking surveys, uh, thinking about you know, uh, giving a whole bunch of different users uh, a certain tasks to do and recording uh, what steps they take to do it and whether that was what you expected or not. Uh, getting the users to say how it made them feel, how good they think it looks, and all, all sorts of things like that. Um, so year nine and ten, you're getting them to to think a bit more thoroughly about um, how the users uh, use and interact with that thing. So it looks like we've got some people doing bits and pieces of all of those, which is great. Uh, and if you're not doing those currently, well, now you've got some ideas of of what you can do in your classrooms. Uh, all right. So. That that was everything. Uh, we're done for now. Uh, you've learned everything you need to know about human to human interactions and human community interactions, or at least you've learned a little bit about everything that you need to know. Um, and so uh, we'll send out an email uh, summarizing uh, uh, with a link to to the uh, YouTube video for this uh, webinar and. Uh, we'll also include the uh, links to the slides uh, if there are any resources that you missed as we were going along. Um, 
but yeah, uh, that's all the things that we would recommend uh, doing your classes and uh, thinking about, especially in those younger years, uh, doing those uh, activities where you're creating and collaborating with digital technologies in the older years, uh, using uh, digital technologies to plan and communicate and collaborate your projects and uh, thinking about how different designs affect the, the tasks we do and uh, how you can create effective designs for other people. Uh, yeah, so that was interactions. Uh, so we'd like to thank you for coming.